Hello. And welcome to the 2122 Fairbanks Lecture Series in Clinical Ethics. Today's lecture is co-sponsored by the RESPECT Center, an IUPUI signature center that focuses on research and palliative and end-of-life communication training. I'm Alexia Torkey, an affiliate faculty member at the Fairbanks Center and a co-director of the RESPECT Center, and thank you for joining us today both remotely and on person. First, a couple of preliminaries for our lecture today. While we've all become masters of Zoom, we appreciate your patience and understanding for any technical issues that might develop. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website, fairbankcenter.org, within the next week. The recording will be eligible for CE for 30 days. We encourage you to send your colleagues the information. You'll also receive a link to the evaluation for CME and CE tomorrow at the email address you used when you registered for the webinar. We encourage you to fill out the evaluation, even if you do not need credit. This not only helps us track virtual attendance, but allows you to provide feedback and comments on the lecture. The question and answer box is available to post questions. However, we will not be responding to most questions until the end of the presentation when Dr. Hansen is ready. And there'll also be an opportunity for those of you in the room to ask questions. Dr. Hansen has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Hansen. She's a professor in the Division of Geriatric Medicine, Department of Medicine at the University of North Carolina, where she also serves as director of the Palliative Care Program. Board certified in internal medicine, geriatric medicine, and hospital and palliative medicine, she provides clinical care for frail and seriously ill patients in diverse settings. To support expansion of real-world dementia care clinical trials, she leads the patient and caregiver relevant outcomes core for the NIA Embedded Pragmatic Alzheimer's Disease and ADRD Clinical Trials Impact Collaboratory. To enhance the field of palliative care research, she's founding member of the Palliative Care Research Cooperative and currently co-leads its measures core. At UNC, Dr. Hansen leads a program of funded research to improve the quality of care and outcomes for people with dementia and other older adults living with serious illness. She's been principal investigator or co-investigator for efficacy, effectiveness, and pragmatic trials in dementia palliative care, including the first multi-site clinical trial of hospital-based palliative care for people with late-stage dementia. Dr. Hansen's been a wonderful colleague and someone I've admired over the years, and I'm just delighted to welcome her to IU Health. Thank you, Lexi. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and also for the invitation to provide this particular lecture as part of a two-day visit here in Indiana. I have visited this campus once before and I feel an incredible amount of synergy and connection with what you do here in Indiana and what we do at the University of North Carolina where we have that connection to a people of a state um, and thoughts about how to improve their care. Okay, they promised me it would work. But that's not happening. There we go. We got it, we got it. Um, so these are my objectives. I'll try to do this uh, in a timely way so we'll have time for questions. I wanna just start out by talking about the public and individual impact of dementia, then turn to a topic that I think we don't think enough about in our approach to patients and families, which is to really describe the trajectory and prognosis of this disease. Because until we have a shared prognostic understanding with people living with diseases, it's really hard for us to get to other aspects of treatment choices. I'll spend some time on evidence-based palliation for symptoms in this disease, which I think is exceptionally challenging. And then I'll talk about some ethical decision-making in dementia care. Funding, um, I've already, uh, Lexi's already said that I have no financial conflicts to report. These are current and recent funding sources for my work. Um, I'm going to start out with a few notes on terminology. It's a little bit dry and boring, but I want to make sure that as I'm using terms, they make sense to you in the same way that they make sense to me. So I will use the term dementia um, pretty often because it's the common clinical term that we use for a syndrome 
It's not a diagnosis. It's a syndrome of irreversible progressive cognitive impairment affecting function, but it has many causes. It's a commonly used term, but my husband, who's an historian and who often sensitizes me to issues, says, y'all got to get rid of this word because dementia sounds like demented. Um, and I do worry sometimes about this terminology, even though it's in common use. I worry about how our patients and families understand it. I will use the term ADRD or Alzheimer's disease and related dementias because this terminology is now commonly used by NIH to describe a grouping of common diseases that cause the dementia syndrome. I typically won't use this term, but the, it's important to know that in the world of psychiatry, the DSM-5 uses the terminology mild or major neurocognitive disorder in place of the term dementia. It's a bit of a mouthful and not in common parlance, but you will hear it. So what are all AD, what is ADRD? What's Alzheimer's and related dementias? Well, it's a grouping of conditions that are longer than the list on this slide, but include Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, Parkinsonian dementia, and a wild array of variants within that group, as well as other causes like vascular dementia or alcohol-induced dementia. A lot of the work I do focuses on the later stages of disease and the clinical features of these different causes tend to merge in the later stages. And interestingly, in the small number of patients whose brains end up in autopsy study, mixed pathology is actually quite common by the time people die from this condition. Public health impact. So I like to say, I can throw out public health statistics about dementia that beat all my cardiology colleagues, all of my oncology colleagues, because this disease has societal impact like nothing else out there. There are five to six million Americans right now living with ADRD and over a million who have late stage or advanced disease. The societal costs every year for this condition are in the billions, and it's the only major serious illness that we commonly see that really has no effective pharmacologic prevention or treatment. So what I talk to you about today is how we're going to have to think about caring for these people for the foreseeable future. The individual impact is also extraordinary, and I'd like I know I can't see raised hands on the virtual part of this talk, but just in the auditorium, how many of you have experienced individual family impact of dementia? So I'll just say for the virtual audience that most of the hands went up in the room, and I think that's really important to keep in mind. For the individual who's living with the disease, in the later stages, this illness becomes incredibly symptomatic, but that symptomatic phase lasts for years of time. It's a condition that not only affects the brain, but because this is command and control, eventually affects the entire body and people end up with a lot of physical symptoms that we don't necessarily automatically associate with this condition. There are high rates of pain, shortness of breath, constipation, and feeding problems are almost universal for this population. We're all aware that neuropsychiatric symptom distress is a big part of this disease phenomenon and people end up with physical restlessness. They can't sit still, they can't stay in bed, um, resisting personal care that they are dependent on others for, apathy, withdrawal, passivity, delusions, hallucinations, and in a cruel twist, to family caregivers, sleep-wake disruptions that are an inherent part of the brain disease. And then finally, because of the effects on the body, this is a population that in the later stages ends up with a lot of medical complications, 
infections, falls, injury, the feeding problems leading to aspiration or dehydration. And then the family impact, which really you were raising your hands to attest to. This is a condition that really imposes a part-time job on family caregivers, but it's an unpaid part-time job in delivering practical daily care, emotional support, care coordination, and surrogate decision-making. They become the voice in the healthcare system for this individual. Families experience this phenomenon of becoming healthcare nomads. The person with dementia and the family caregiver are alone in the healthcare system because the primary care provider can no longer deliver in the later stages. Maybe the person is too um, impaired to actually come to the PCP office or the PCP is no longer connected because this person has moved to an assisted living center, a memory care unit. And so the family caregiver becomes the care coordinator. Not surprisingly, they experience high rates of stress and measurable physical health impacts as well. And to add insult to injury, this is the single most costly disease to families among all conditions of serious illness. So turning to the topic of palliative care for people with ADRD, how does it differ? Well, this is how I start to think about it as somebody who works at that intersection of geriatrics, dementia care, and palliative care. Prognosis is different. This is an illness with a prolonged course with no defined terminal phase, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And death is caused by treatable medical complications. We say that death is caused by Alzheimer's disease, and we should have that on death certificates, but really the person with Alzheimer's disease dies from pneumonia. And everybody thinks of pneumonia as treatable. Symptoms, if you're gonna manage symptoms in this population, you better be pretty darn good at nonverbal assessment. Um, Non-pharmacologic treatments are the key to symptom management and our healthcare system doesn't make those simple. And to add to the complexity, physical pain or other physical distress and neuropsychiatric distress typically co-occur and can be hard for us to pull apart. Shared decision-making is typically about what we consider to be ordinary care. Should this person with dementia go get their mammogram this year? What's that mammogram experience gonna be like for somebody who doesn't quite understand why this large machine is causing breast pain? Um, and shared decision-making, as I said, is really largely on the caregiver because the patient voice is lost very early in the multi-year trajectory. And then I've mentioned caregiver stress, which is extraordinary and has to be part of palliation. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this idea of trajectory and prognosis first, because I think this is the ground floor for palliative care in this disease maybe in all diseases, but certainly in this one. So this is a really interesting graphic out of a paper that I find really informative that Tom Gill wrote in the New England Journal in 2010. And what this paper really did was do a trajectory analysis of ADL dependency, activities of daily living dependencies in different individuals over the last year of life. And on the x-axis is basically the trajectory of months leading up to death at the end of the x-axis. And on the y-axis is how many ADL dependencies this individual had in that last year. Where are the people with ADRD? You don't have to answer the question. Maybe it's rhetorical, but they're in that top line. So the top line on the graphic shows people who are dependent for most activities of daily living for the entire last year of life. And that's really distinct from many other conditions that ultimately cause death, 
but trigger ADL dependency on others. So the requirement for hands-on physical care only in the final months of life. And that's just not true for this population. So that functional trajectory is actually part of prognosis. It's part of what family caregivers have to be ready for and have to figure out how to accommodate. Um, this is the global deterioration scale. It's one of the staging systems for dementia, primarily focused on Alzheimer's disease. But as I've said, um, ADRD um, grouping can often be kind of extrapolated into staging systems. One thing that I just really want to point out about this staging system is that the staging of dementia, the way that we think about how far along the trajectory people are, is defined not just by cognitive impairment. It's defined also by physical functioning and dependency for daily basic activities, as well as basic communication skills. So when we're actually staging the disease, so we look to see where this person is in the trajectory, we think not only about their memory, but we also think about how they communicate and how they bathe, how they go to the bathroom, how they walk or don't. As I said, mostly I'm focused on late stage dementia. That's what interests me. That's the population that I'm passionate about. And I personally define that as stage five, six, and seven. And the reason that I choose to do that is these are the stages where basically the person cannot go it alone. Every single day they need help once you reach stage five of this condition. You're still probably several years from the end of life, but every day you need to lean on other human beings in order to just get through your day. Part of the trajectory and part of the prognosis is also the punctuation of the course of dementia itself with acute illness. So I kind of gave you a preview of this by saying that these acute illnesses are actually how these individuals ultimately die. But before that death occurs from acute illness, for many, many months, if not a few years time leading up to death, their trajectory is a punctuated course with episodes of pneumonia, episodes of other febrile illness, episodes of feeding problems. And um, those punctuations are the signals in this disease that the person may be growing closer to death. This is data on those episodes out of the large cascade study by Susan Mitchell. She studied a large group of people with stage seven dementia, so the latest stage we know how to, how to describe, and followed them over an 18-month time period, and only 55% of them died during those 18 months, and only 22% of them had a hospice referral during those 18 months. So that kind of shows you that in the latest stage of this disease, we know how to describe if you say to a family member, your mom has end-stage dementia, you're still saying that that person probably has more than a year left to live. And that's, again, a very different prognostic context than the way we talk about end-stage other conditions. What about hospice prognosis? So wouldn't it be ideal if this person is in end-stage disease and they're suffering that we could offer hospice as an option? Well, unfortunately, the trajectory of the way this disease progresses over time, it just doesn't fit the hospice six-month paradigm. This is an ROC curve. It's kind of a complicated statistics curve, but basically this curve, if it crosses diagonally across the box, 
means that our ability to predict death is the same as a coin flip. And you can see that this is the best prognostic model we have thus far for people with stage seven dementia. And it's pretty close to a coin flip if we look at somebody with stage seven and think about them and say, this person's probably gonna die in the next six months. We're just as likely to be right as we are to be wrong. And that's not useful for enrolling that person in hospice care. So many of you probably know the hospice guidance for dementia. In order for somebody to have a hospice diagnosis of ADRD, they have to have stage seven disease plus. Stage seven is not sufficient. And there has to be clear evidence that they also have nutritional decline or repeated infections that are significant or advanced decubitus ulcers in order to qualify for hospice. So that's that combination of the severity of the underlying condition itself plus the acute conditions layered on top. This of course means that it's pretty hard for these folks to get to hospice. So just kind of summarizing some of the prognostic time frame. If I'm working with a family member whose loved one has recently gotten a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, if they ask me or if I wanna share information about prognosis, I'll let them know that life expectancy from diagnosis is somewhere in the three to nine year range with a lot of individual variability. There are a lot of reasons for that but, um, that I won't dive into. If I'm seeing somebody and I assess them as having stage seven dementia, I can say that their median survival is still almost one and a half years time. So that stage seven, a life expectancy of a year or more. If I see somebody and I'm trying to figure out, is this somebody I can really advocate for the six month prognosis in hospice, I'm gonna be looking for the population who has stage seven disease and persistent feeding problems, recurrent febrile illness or pneumonia, or at least from a couple of studies, they've been hospitalized for either a severe pneumonia or a hip fracture. And I can make an argument in those populations that we're getting close to hospice prognosis. So what I do as a palliative care provider and what a number of you um, here in the auditorium do is try to translate all of that medical knowledge into a way to talk about prognosis, a way to talk with family caregivers in this situation. So these are some words to try. Tell me what you understand about your wife's illness and overall health. We know to start open-ended and it can really shock you what you hear back, including <laughs> my wife has a little memory trouble when she actually has stage six Alzheimer's disease. Um, exploring how they understand prognosis. I know the doctors are focused on his pneumonia and it's being treated, but what I'd like to know more about is how he was doing a month ago. How were things for him before the pneumonia? So I get a sense of what that baseline dementia lived experience might be. Um, I see in the record that your mother has some problems with memory and thinking. That's my favorite phrase when I'm not sure I can drop the word dementia. Um, what do you think is causing these problems so that I get some clarity as to their understanding? I think it's also really important to think about how we write about prognosis because in this condition, when we record it in the medical record, we may support or undermine access to hospice. So recording stage can be useful. 
um, but really important recording how comorbid conditions also contribute. So stage six major neurocognitive disorder, likely vascular dementia due to comorbid systolic CHF with frequent exacerbations, life expectancy is months. And then communicating that prognosis to families, so important to help them put together this long trajectory of the underlying dementia with the impact of acute illness that individually would seem treatable or curable, but layered on top of the dementia is really a different prognosis. So I wish things were different for your dad, but given his two recent heart failure episodes and severe dementia, I worry he may be facing some difficult times ahead. Would it help you if I shared a bit more about what could happen in the months to come? So asking permission to give a perspective on what the future holds. So I think around prognosis, recording ADRD stage or thinking about stage and communicating it is actually quite important in understanding the trajectory and promoting prognostic understanding, but then concurrently thinking about and communicating acute illnesses such as hip fracture, recurrent infections, or nutritional decline. All right, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit from prognosis. You've been working with this patient with dementia and their family, and you've understood what the family understands about the illness and their perspective on the trajectory or prognosis of the disease. So I wanna talk a little bit about symptom distress and how to approach symptom distress in this population. I will tell you that I came into dementia palliative care around decision-making. And I still think that ethical decision-making for this population is critically important. But I learned in the course of both my clinical work and my research work in this field that if all I do is talk about goals of care and I don't address suffering, I will not meet the needs of this population. So I wanna put these two things together and encourage that assessing symptom distress and addressing symptom distress is like putting out the fire before you ever address goals of care communication. So symptom distress pre-death, this is again some data out of Cascade, this very large study of people with stage seven disease. I told you over 18 months, only 55% of them died. But during that time, their symptoms were carefully and systematically tracked. And what you can see here is on the bottom axis, there's the names of different types of symptoms. And on the Y axis, the percent of people with stage seven dementia who were actively expressing symptom distress in that category. You can see that dyspnea starts out affecting about 10% in the, uh, the nine to 12 months prior to death. But as we get closer to death across the bars, it ends up being a symptom distress problem for a third of the population. Same thing with pain, same thing with pressure ulcers, same thing with aspiration episodes until about a third of the population in the final three months of life is experiencing this form of symptom distress. You can see there's a category which my good friend Susan Mitchell labeled agitation. I'm just here to tell you that word agitates me and I never use it. But what she really meant, I know, is neuropsychiatric distress. So the emotional symptom cluster that comes for people with dementia, really different in that it's present for a large percentage of the population the entire last year of life. And actually, more than the last year. So this is kind of the symptom profile that we see when we're approaching this population. 
but darn it, it's really tough. If you walk into the room of a person with dementia and you want to be helpful, but they're kind of grimacing and they're like sitting in their chair and they're kind of moving around and you go to touch them on the shoulder and they slap you. How do you know what's wrong? And you ask a really nice way in your good, calm, soothing voice. How are you, Ms. Smith? Are you hurting anywhere? And she just growls at you or doesn't say anything at all. It's incredibly difficult to assess, but here are some assessment tips around pain. So the first thing to say is there's still a goodly percentage of people with dementia, not very late stage, but people who are still verbal who can actually utilize a pain scale. But they need you to use words not numbers. So that beautiful 10 point scale, and, and if you think about it, it's right. My pain is a seven? What the heck does that mean? I have no idea. And once somebody gets a little bit of cognitive impairment, numbers are an abstraction. They mean nothing. So never try to use that with this population. Um, but they can sometimes say, yeah, it's not a bad pain or it really hurts. And so using words is helpful. These folks have some memory problems. So asking how the pain today compares to the pain yesterday is probably a lost cause. But asking today about the pain, hearing what they say, and then tomorrow seeing them and asking again about the pain allows you to make a comparison that they can't make. Um, all of the causes of ADRD affect language function. So it's also important to recognize that sometimes you'll approach somebody with dementia and the word pain has no meaning for them anymore. It's no longer in their brain as a meaningful word, but hurt might be meaningful to them or discomfort might be meaningful. So you might have to move around the language to find a way to connect. You have to speak slowly their brains are processing slowly. So the way I'm speaking to you, because I trust your brains to process fast, you cannot speak to a person with moderate severity dementia. You have to slow the pace down and give them plenty of time to answer. And then fundamentally, you have to observe. So watching behaviors and keeping in mind that pain behaviors in this population can go different directions. So the person might be more passive, more withdrawn, and they might have stopped eating, and that might be pain, or they might be more agitated, more aggressive, more physically restless, and that might be pain. One of the key strategies that I use all the time is to watch movement and personal care. So if I enter the room and physical therapy is working with them or the nursing aide is gonna turn them and clean their backside, I ask permission to stay and observe because a lot of the pain that these folks are experiencing is musculoskeletal pain or pain from wounds. And that pain is not a big deal when they're just completely still in bed. But when you try to move the shoulder that has capsular ad as adhesive capsulitis, or when you try to turn the person and do wound care on their backside, all of a sudden you're seeing a distinct pain syndrome that you wouldn't see if you were just trying to work with them while they're still. So keep that in mind. And if you can take advantage of other staff members, that's great for movement. If you can't, then help the person move yourself and see how they respond. Fundamentally, all symptom management in this population starts away from pharmacotherapy. So non-medication-based treatments are really important even in managing pain. So I already said that most of the pain that's experienced by this population is gonna have a musculoskeletal cause. There are certainly other causes, but much of it is gonna be musculoskeletal. 
Some of it you can actually treat and take away, but a lot of it's gonna be chronic. So you think about the complexity of the pain experience they have, things like music, a calm environment, added distractions, emotional support, spiritual support. These are all things that for a person with dementia go beyond language to the emotional and spiritual experience of living in pain. And many of them have lived in pain for a very long time. So keep these in your toolkit and recognize that these are actually strategies that are legitimate approaches to a person's physical pain. Warm or cold packs, assisted movement, repositioning, joint supports, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Those are all non-pharmacologic strategies that are appropriate for musculoskeletal pain. And many of them require interpersonal interaction, which is ultimately done right, calming and comforting to the person with dementia. Music therapy, I'll just mention, um, how many of you, again, a show of hands, how many of you know the website Music and Memory? Anybody know that? Okay, I see one hand. Now you've heard of it, now you can go look at it. I just mention it because somewhere deep in my past, I'm a musician. I love this sort of, it's partly research and it's partly um, people trying creative things. And I, I encourage you to look at music and memory. So one of the deepest parts somehow of the human brain is our response to music, our response to rhythm. And in the progressive course of ADRD, there are many people who cannot be reached by language, who can be reached emotionally by music. And the Music and Memory website is a testimony to that and gives some visual examples um, that you all may, may find interesting. I'll just say anecdotally that my own grandmother died with advanced dementia. And even after she had been nonverbal for an extended period of time, she used to play the piano and sing. She had two songs that she could go and pick out with one finger on the piano. And they were Amazing Grace and the Eyes of Texas Are Upon You. <laughs> Um, and those were so deeply bound in that muscle memory for her that she could do that even a few weeks before her death from the ravages of this condition. Um, there have been some randomized controlled trials. This is probably helpful for depressed mood, apathy, withdrawal, quality of life, but it is not the solution to disruptive behaviors. So if you have somebody and you think, ah, music calms the wild beast, probably not going to be your answer. Um, here's the one good quality pain medication trial that I usually share with people in um, dementia care. So this was a cluster randomized trial with blinded assessments of outcomes that was done in nursing homes in Norway. And they basically took a group of individuals with stage four or higher dementia who already were expressing neuropsychiatric distress. So they had a lot of restlessness and a lot of distress expression. And they just put them on a stepwise pain protocol where they basically started with the equivalent of Tylenol. And if scheduled Tylenol didn't seem to change the distress behaviors, then they added a very low dose opioid, and then they could add a little bit of buprenorphine or a little bit of gabapentin on top. Most of the enrolled participants stopped at either scheduled Tylenol or scheduled Tylenol plus a little bit of opioid. Um, and then they looked eight weeks down the road to see how things looked and their agitation scale, their psychiatric symptom scale and their pain scales we're all improved on this approach. 
So this is kind of my approach. This is how I think about pain management. I start with the safest options, which is basically the non-pharmacologic approach, then topical analgesics, then scheduled acetaminophen, maybe short-term non-steroidals. I reassess where the person's comfort is, maybe substitute or add a low-dose scheduled opioid, and then maybe consider buprenorphine or gabapentin. Really important, and y'all already know this, to use opioids with caution in this population because they experience them over a longer half-life. They don't get rid of them as fast as others, um, younger patients do, and they experience more falls and constipation. So neuropsychiatric symptoms, the other big source of distress. Well, I think it's important to recognize that there's all kinds of things within this category. And I will say as a geriatrician, we have kind of a paradigmatic situation that happens for us on call. We get a call from a nursing home. We're not there, we're on call. There's a nurse at the nursing home who says, so-and-so has dementia, she's agitated, can I have something? And I wanna say, I'd like to prescribe some Xanax for you, but I don't say that. I instead say, um, tell, me about, tell me more about this person. Because what I really wanna know, that's a distressed behavior. And my first question is, why is this person distressed? Because they might have a whole host of reasons for being distressed. But in, in the absence of a good assessment, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss the boat. It could be physical pain. It could be delirium. I'm going to ask the question, is this a real change from the level of confusion or the type of behavior that this person usually expresses? It could be an environmental trigger. Frankly, you know, it could be one of those yelling daytime shows where people are threatening each other and attacking each other on the screen. Imagine what that feels like if you have moderate stage dementia. It could be a loud noise. It could be rough personal care. There are a lot of different things in the environment. Um, it could be, and this is intrinsic to some people with dementia, an internal delusion, a stimulus that acts as a distress trigger for them. Very commonly, it's a delusion that they're not in the right place and they need to go home. And that's very distressing to feel, and they feel it over and over again. Um, it might be a sense that they're being attacked or abused. I had one patient who actually had physical sexual abuse as a teenager, and all of those memories surfaced in the midst of late stage dementia. And he experienced it over again. It might be that they see somebody in the mirror and they're terrified of that image in the mirror. So thinking about what delusions might cause this. Hallucinations also occur in the disease. They're uncommon. Um, many aren't even distressing. And then just physical restlessness may be part of the issue. Interventions for neuropsychiatric symptoms, um, really the treatment is the environment and interpersonal care. It is the primary treatment. You've got to think about those underlying causes I just described and find interventions that treat pain, that treat acute medical illnesses causing delirium. You've got to create a calm and soothing environment with the right interpersonal interactions. You can try sensory modalities like aromatherapy, music, familiar objects, um, sleep-wake cycle support, and compassionate interpersonal care. This is really the gold standard for neuropsychiatric distress. Medications are just not the answer. It's really frustrating. It's so nice to be able to write a prescription and come up with the answer, but maybe an empiric trial of pain medicine maybe a low-dose trial of trazodone, especially for sleep-wake cycle, possibly citalopram, possibly rivastigmine in Lewy body dementia. There are no FDA-approved medications, 
and many medications have FDA warnings on them against their use in this population. I'm here to say that does not mean they don't get used, but it's really important to know what context you're in if you decide to use one. All right, I'm gonna finish up with a bit about communication and decision-making because we've thought about prognosis and trajectory. We've shared prognostic insights with the family. We've looked at the sources of distress and we've tried to assess those and provide intervention. So my next move is not a goals of care conversation. And I think this is also really important. My next new move is ask the family caregiver, how are you doing? And let them just talk and find out how they're doing, how much support they have, what kinds of needs they are experiencing. And those can be in the practical domain, the emotional domain, the spiritual domain, the financial domain, because these people in late stage dementia are walking through life as a partnership. If they're lucky, there are people with late stage dementia who don't have a caregiver, but if you can't address the stresses that the caregiver is experiencing, and maximize support for the dyad, for the two of them, it doesn't matter what you do for the person with dementia. You're not going to ultimately be successful in palliation because you have to address that partnership. So this is just to sort of highlight that there have been some randomized controlled trials of caregiver support in this disease in order to just focus on the kind of information and psychosocial support these individuals need with evidence that it improves their quality of life, their psychiatric distress, and interestingly, allows them to grieve less when the person actually dies from their dementia. Um, you may have to engage with the caregiver around the tube feeding decision, um, just sort of highlighting that tube feeding does not improve outcomes in people with late stage dementia, and three professional organizations recommend against it. The American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, the American Geriatric Society, um, and AMDA all recommend against even offering or using it in this disease as a result. I think it's really important to think about then you're stuck in a room with the caregiver who says, mom is aspirating or mom is not eating. What am I supposed to do? Um, and what I do is spend time talking with the caregiver about what happens during feeding, what they observe, and then talking about assisted or supported feeding. And that means hand feeding. How does this person get assisted or help to eat? It means the right environment, a calm environment typically. It means sometimes modifying diets, but I'm just here to say, please don't put these folks on thickened liquids, not unless you're willing to drink them yourself. And if you've ever tried to do that, you'll probably not recommend them again. Um, it's really tempting. We understand how that might affect aspiration. I actually do that totally differently. What I do is I work with the family caregiver and I talk with them about foods that have the right texture and a lot of water. So pieces of melon, um, smoothies, soups that are pureed, things like that so that the water can go in. It doesn't have to be eight cups of water a day, but Lord forbid, it also doesn't have to be thickened liquids, which really are difficult for anybody to tolerate. You might think about high calorie supplements. There is some moderate evidence that they're helpful for at least short um, phases of treatment of dietary problems in this population. I think it's also really good to think about our framing language when we talk about feeding problems. So I talk about help with eating by mouth or natural feeding rather than tube feeding. 
I talk about natural foods and I talk about eating for comfort and pleasure and kind of highlighting the reasons why we enjoy eating in the first place. Um, I will just highlight that one of the first studies that I did enrolling this population was a randomized controlled trial of a decision aid called Making Choices, which posed the choice of tube feeding or eating by mouth. And it's a simple decision aid. It's available online for free. And it just walks through in a matter of 15 minutes how this choice is made, what the issues are. And when we used it with family caregivers, it improved their knowledge about this choice, decreased their feelings of conflict, increased their confidence and their actual communication with physicians and APPs, increased the use of modified diets and decreased weight loss for the population of individuals with ADRD. All right, and I'm gonna kind of wrap up with talking about goals of care discussions. So goals of care means different things, honestly, to different clinicians, I find. But this is how I think about the goals of care framework. Um, it means that we're kind of back to Trudeau's concept that our goal as healthcare providers is to cure sometimes, to relieve often, and to comfort always. When we're working with a population of people with ADRD, the first goal of cure is off the table. So we just can't talk about cure. Um, we're not going to successfully restore health. We're not gonna take the disease away, but we can focus on treatment plans that prolong survival, or we can focus on function and maximizing the person's cognitive and physical functioning or we can focus on comfort as a primary goal. And we have to keep in mind all the time that those are medical domain goals, but people have personal goals. They, that's what we mean when we say quality of life. And it might mean staying home and not coming back to the hospital all the time. It might mean being as alert and cognitively sharp as possible but it also might mean living on to an important family event. And those personal goals have to be integrated with medical goals. So what characterizes decision-making for this population is that it's surrogate decision-making. The major choices this population faces match the POLST paradigm. So I know this is POLST central here. And it's a really interesting phenomenon that even though the POLST wasn't technically developed for the ADRD population, it is quite effective as a way to guide a conversation. I actually did a study called the Goals of Care Dist Study in which we again tested a video decision aid around the Goals of Care framework and asked family caregivers to think about how they prioritized prolonging life, promoting function, or promoting comfort, how they prioritized those goals, and then how they would accept a treatment plan that aligned with those goals. One thing that we learned was even in stage five dementia, a majority of families prioritized comfort already. And these people still have at least one to three years left to live. Um, with the decision aid, there was better communication, better goal concordance, increased use of palliative care content in treatment plans, and much to our surprise, doubled the use of POLST, even though we never mentioned POLST in the decision aid at all. But the goals of care framework was helpful um, in aligning that we were also able to reduce the frequency of hospitalizations. So um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna just wrap up by saying, this is how I ultimately think about um, palliative care for dementia. I start with thinking about what this person's dementia stage is. Where are they on the trajectory of the disease? 
I spend time talking about prognosis to further prognostic understanding, including the punctuation with acute illness. I address and treat physical and neuropsychiatric symptom distress. I address feeding problems and nutritional status. And then finally, I get to goals of care and related treatment choices. I hope this overview has been helpful to you and I'm happy to take any questions that people here or people online might have. So we already have a question online. Um, someone is asking, do you have any teaching resources for caregivers and ECFs regarding those non-pharmacological measures to address and reduce behavioral issues? Ooh, that's a loaded question. So the fundamental answer is no, I don't have any teaching resources. Although I will say that I send family caregivers to the music and memory website. Um, and encourage them to think about creating a playlist or bringing in favorite recordings that are available in the individual's room. Um, it's a, I say it's a loaded question because I think one of the things that's fundamentally challenging about non-pharmacologic interventions is our healthcare system is not well set up to support them and family caregivers may learn about things that are effective. Maybe aromatherapy is helpful. A lavender oil is helpful to have a calming scent in the room, but they may often have to work hard to implement that because it's not a natural pathway. It's not something insurance covers. It's not something that we're readily accommodating in the healthcare system. So. Um, I am not aware of those resources. I think it would be brilliant if somebody in this audience was inspired to create one. Okay, so I'll keep going. I will um, give a shout out. Um, Lexi's a researcher, um, James says, not a question, but would like to thank you for the excellent explanation of the ROC curve. <laughs> Um, so here is a question. Were Black, Brown, Asian, and Native American population assessed in your study or other studies that you have cited? Oh, thank you for that. Yes. Um, one of the things that I'm really pleased with that working in North Carolina, um, we have a significant uh, African American population that is aging in North Carolina. So I think that's important to comment on. Um, and so about 20% of participants in almost all my studies are African-American, somewhere in the 20 to 25% participation. We actually looked in the studies to see if there was a difference in response for African-Americans compared to white participants, and we did not see any differences in the decision aid studies. Um, in our environment, the Hispanic Latino population is quite large, but still not quite aged into the ADRD, especially late stage ADRD population, but we know that's coming. And it's a really important aspect of inclusivity in thinking about doing this work. Please. So Tim, I want to be able to have people online hear you. So Kelsey's coming. This is even better. Um, so I'm the medical director for IU Health Hospice. And I, I guess I would love to he maybe hear your thoughts on that disconnect between the prognostication and trajectory of dementia, hospice criteria, and the fact that the kind of care that hospice provides is a huge boon to patients and families with this illness. Can you comment on that big disconnect yeah. there? No, I, I really appreciate the question. I will tell you that in my dream world, um, we would have a different model of hospice for this population because I really think what this population needs is to be able to, when comfort is the primary goal, enroll in hospice services for perhaps an 18 month trajectory with high delivery of nursing aid services, because there's an extraordinary need for personal cleanliness support of ADLs. And the current hospice model not only is wrong in terms of the six month window, 
And, and there's a lot of suffering there. And I would like to see more ADRD patients in hospice in those final months, but the hospice team structure underemphasizes the need for the brilliant care that talented nursing assistants provide. And that kind of interpersonal, it's not just the cleanup, it's the interpersonal relational care that these people need and crave and can be an extraordinary source of comfort, but we need a hospice model built to acknowledge that that is the distribution of needs. Um, there are, I, I, I will say there's something on the flip side that's important, which is that not all hospice providers feel comfortable with this population. And I think there's a need even within hospice organizations to have some more outreach, education. Um, some hospice organizations have specialized long-term care teams that may enhance their dementia specific skills. So I, I, I also think that's another area where hospices can be effective. There's, there's a Hospice of the Valley organization in Phoenix, Arizona that I've been privileged to work with. And Hospice of the Valley is the single most impressive dementia focused resource in hospice care that I've ever seen. Um, and they work closely with another organization in Phoenix, a long-term care organization called the Beatitudes. And they've developed a partnership that's really powerful in expertise in dementia, hospice and palliative care. And they both have websites. That's a really nice resource for hospice providers. Thank you. All right, well, we have run out of time, but I did wanna give, um, Dr. Sachs um, has written in he, on the notes that the Healthy Aging Brain Program at Eskenazi has educational materials and handout for caregivers on managing behavioral disturbance non-pharmacologically. And some of those have been tested by NIH studies. So uh, you can reach out to the Healthy Brain Program at Eskenazi. So and you can talk to Fantastic. Dr. Sachs. So. That's great. All right, thank you so very much right. for coming You're so and sharing welcome. with us today.